Welcome to The Millionaire Hairstylist, where our mission is to improve the financial well-being of creative professionals. If you've ever wondered how to work with celebrities as a hairstylist, or maybe how to work in creative campaigns, commercials, on set, films, etc. If you've ever struggled to raise your prices, and if you have a concern about what am I going to do at the end of my career when I can't do hair anymore, how will I have a financial future and safety for myself? That is what we'll cover in the next three episodes of this podcast in a series we're calling Becoming a Millionaire Hairstylist, exploring the financial, business, and career concepts that helped our founder, celebrity hairstylist Cash Lawless, go from sweeping the floor of a salon to cutting Justin Bieber's hair from a $5 service to a $500 service to as much as a $15,000 service, how to raise your prices, and then ultimately how to build real wealth beyond just working for earned income beyond the chair. Today's episode will be focused all on that first part, working on set, working in commercials, film, and television, and working with celebrities. Whether or not that's your goal, I guarantee you there'll be concepts that we'll talk about in this conversation that will be applicable to your career as a creative, as a hairstylist today. Let's get started. You know, Cash, you and I have a lot of conversations when we talk about creative professionals. We talk about makeup artists and hairstylists, and we sort of always talk about it in the context of building a, a skill as a hairdresser and then a sort of ultimate destination entrepreneurially of starting a salon. But of course, you built your career, and to a certain extent, even though I'm not a hairstylist, I built my career in the world of production, commercials, music videos, movies, TV shows, short films, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought it'd be fun because I think a lot of this audience are people who are in that salon environment, and there's a lot to be said for that. I think a lot of people, that's that's their goal. But I know there are some people, and we've had people ask about this, and we've had content we put out over the years people responded to about this, where they're curious as sort of like the other side of the coin. Because a production life, if that's what you decide you want to do or pursue, or or make as part of the things that you pursue, right? You can kind of do both. But the production life can mean traveling to interesting places. It can mean working with interesting people. It can mean, as, as, as you did in your case, working with celebrities. There's a real variety to working in onset anything, in this case, onset hairstyling, because every single production is different. And for those who have not experienced that, I think there's always a little bit of a question of how does one get into that? And then more importantly, how does someone become good at that? And then I think some people are even always a little curious, like, how did you start working with John Mayer? and Justin Bieber, and Kylie and Kendall, and all these people. So I thought it'd be fun to just kind of explore that part of your story. And I think we might pick up and extract some lessons learned along the way of, how does one get into that world? Because you started in a salon as an assistant, and maybe start there in your story. How did you go from the person working in the salon environment to the person who found themselves on set, as it were? Great question. I will say a series of fortunate events. I'd be an idiot if I if I said, oh, I was just so good, I was just bound to happen, that's absolutely not true. I was a terrible hairdresser in the beginning. There were some lucky moments in which we all have opportunities pass our, our way, but I do believe that I was obsessively prepared for them. And when they came along, I was able to seize them. And there were just a few pivotal moments in my career. Before I get to those moments, though, and kind of preparing for that in the beginning of my career, I thought I was going to be a salon hairdresser. I wanted to be a very successful salon hairdresser. Then I thought I would be a salon owner. And then I thought, you know, I would be a platform artist. There were many different identities I went through before uncovering the one that I was supposed to be doing or the one that I was uniquely gifted for. And, and, there are probably a lot of people at any different stage of those phases where you're still like, what's next for me? Or what do I want this career path to look like? And you get curious about these things, working with celebrities or magazines or ads or commercials or TV or movies or salon work or wig work. It's, the list is endless for hairstylists. There's so many career niches that can and paths that can be gone down. When I first started, it was in the old school days. And, and some people would say, you started in the new school. Some of my mentors would say that to me. So I won't, I won't say old school. But it was in the era where assistants were assisting for five to seven years before going out on their own. That is not going to happen today, right? There's just no assistant. No. Assistant a that's year is considered long. a long time to be an assistant uh, now. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that's kind of the expectation these days. But I thought... You know, I want to be the best 
version of this I can. So, you know, I, I studied as hard as I could. I bought as many DVDs as I could. I practiced, I, I would sit there and watch movies and practice my braiding. I would try new techniques. And this was before YouTube was really, you could learn anything on YouTube. There was nothing. And so I would flip through magazines and just try to look for inspiration and then try to copy what they were doing in Vogue. And so I picked up a very editorial style. I would, I would try to get my hands on anything interesting and try to copy it and, and learn that technique or see if I could replicate it in my own way. But that was when I was in the salon. I didn't, I didn't have, no one was shooting the hair. No one was like these weird things that I was making. I was making headdresses and huge hair. Now you were just to be clear, you were in New York, right? So I mean, you I started thought, in yeah, Jacksonville, yeah. Florida, but after yeah. graduating from Sassoon's in London, you got an opportunity to come to New York and you're working as an assistant in a New York salon. So that was sort of, sort of ground, you know. Yeah. So I'm working in the salon. I'm making six bucks an hour in New York city. So obviously I'm rolling in it. <laughs> and then I go to, I, I really just love, I want to be the best I can be. Right. So I, I go buy these $30 wigs from wigs and plus on 14th street and they're acrylic or nylon or, you know, like the, the most horrible texture you could possibly and i would try to style them and eventually i learned oh you can use a steamer to style this texture or this type of fabric and it's like i couldn't afford the the real wigs finally saved up to get a real wig and so i was practicing and practicing then i got together with a photographer i'm still working at the salon mind you got together with a, a friend who was a photographer and we called modeling agencies and said hey we're doing test shoots and we want to see if we can use some of your models or whatever we had ridiculous scripts to make us sound we were more important but we would shoot up in an apartment in harlem it take me two hours to get up there and I was working in a salon. And then an opportunity came along for me to do the wig for a celebrity. And I was prepared. And this other hairdresser, who was a major celebrity hairstylist, still is, said, you know, I know you can do this. Just, you know, you can take over. He couldn't make it or something. I forget the circumstances, but I went and did the job and I did well. And that person liked me, they, I, you know, and, and I met some really cool people on that set and met some makeup artists and met some met a publicist. And so these are the first people that I'm really meeting. And then I also get an opportunity to go and work on a set. You know, that was for a TV thing. Then I got to go and work on a fashion set. And I knew how to use extensions and I knew how to assist someone or help someone put stuff together. And so they gave me a project. Hey, there's two models. Can you work on this one? And so I did their haircut. I installed the extensions, did their haircut, and they were like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You're the best assistant I've ever had. And, and so that person kept me. And it was another moment of I had been practicing that at home, never knowing that I would need that, just trying to be the best I could be. And so there were just a few moments where preparation met opportunity, and that was a fortunate moment. And these were, to be clear, these first opportunities were established onset stylists who needed an assistant or needed a second to come in either for a particular skill in the case of the wig, or I know there was a famous Natalie Portman story where that person just needed an assistant and their go-to was not available. Was yeah. Okay. I, I definitely have, messed up on that me. one, but the, Nina, you the very Natalie first Portman's hair. Yeah. Well, you can, you can <laughs> see that one on the internet. So I, the very first assistant job outside of a salon. I was working at Sally Hirschberger's salon, the downtown location on 14th street in New York. The manager of the salon got a call from Mark Townsend, major celebrity hairstylist. And he was working on a project with a celebrity and there was nothing going on in the salon. And so me asked Sally, who should we send? Mark's asking, Mark knows Sally. He's just asking for an assistant to be sent over. He needs some help. And she was send cash. He's useless. And um, <laughs> like literally that's, that's what happened. Like the person we need least here is him. Just send him. I, uh, and then Mark and I became friends and still are to this day. And I, he's, he's amazing. But that was not, that was the absolute, the very first moment I got out of the salon. And I just remember calling my girlfriend at the time and being, Oh my gosh, I just worked with so-and-so and so-and-so and then so-and-so's house and all these celebrities and i was my career's made like <laughs> it's, it's made i've arrived it's hap it's happened that was so far from the truth that there was so much work <laughs> more work to be put in no but i know exactly what no but let's be clear i know what that feels like because you know so we're, we're sort of telling your story here but if i can apply a little bit of of um commentary to this so it's okay so yet you have the salon world or in the case of of 
any broader sort of creative industry, you have the sort of the in-house jobs, right? The place where you go to the same place every single day. But if you're in a city like New York, Los Angeles, Dallas, Atlanta, Miami, Chicago, you're going to have onset productions. You're going to have shoots. And again, this might be a photo shoot. This might be a video shoot. The first job I ever got working in any sort of film production was a product commercial that you were the head hairstylist on that you brought me on as a production yeah. assistant yeah, or you referred right. me to the production manager to be a production assistant. So what, what generally happens in these worlds is these two, let's call them fish ponds, do not really overlap. If you're working in a salon every single day, you're not often the person that's going to go be on set, roughly speaking. If you're an in-house person, you're not necessarily always freelancing, right? Because it's a different kind of engagement and you have to sort of be available for that. So every once in a while, these worlds sort of Venn diagram where you get an opportunity to go do an onset gig and meet an onset person who is doing regular onset work and who might, if you do well, hire you again. So again, in my world, I was, well, I wanted to work in film. I wanted to work in production. I didn't know anybody. I didn't even know who to call to get a job as a production assistant, but I knew you and you knew that there was this shoot happening and they were looking for a production assistant. And so you, you, you referred me in. So kind of what you're suggesting about the luck element, which is because the onset world is kind of its own community, the, the head hairstylist or the cinematographer or the AD or any of these department heads, they're going to pick people they work with regularly, right? They're not normally going to call the salon and say, send me an assistant. They have their own roster of people. But if you're working in a salon environment or you're working in-house, I have people I've worked with who are camera techs at camera houses that really want to be on set. At a certain point, an opportunity comes along, whatever that opportunity looks like, where someone says, we need someone to be on set. So cash, and this is a moment I've seen happen for many people. It happened for me, obviously it happened for you. There's just always that one crack in the door for the thing you're interested in. And what I tell people, and I'm curious what you think about this is I tell people at a certain point, as if you set your intention toward wanting to be on set in any capacity, again, commercial film, whatever, you're going to get one opportunity, just the first opportunity. And you have to accept the fact that that opportunity might be a complete bust. It might, it may go nowhere. It might just be the one, and then you need a second one to follow up. But you have to pretend as if that opportunity is the doorway through which the rest of what you want is, is to be found. And so you have to say to yourself, as you were doing, as you were preparing for this, how do I make sure this goes as well as it can possibly go? How do I make sure that I do the best possible job I have when this one opportunity occurs? And if you do that, statistically speaking, you have a really high likelihood of getting a second opportunity. Because like any business, like any industry, like any community, if you're good, people want you to do something again, just because finding good people is actually kind of hard. And that's, that's everywhere. So you have this idea of like, oh, the onset people, they're their own community. Yeah, but they're always looking for good people. So if you get that crack in the door, you want to deliver, you want to do a good job. So here's my question to you. When you got that first assistant job, that first crack in the door, and I know this is, there's sort of a funny answer to this question, but how did that go? And how did you do? And did he call you back to do it again? Talk about lack of preparation uh, <laughs> after telling a story of like, I was preparing. So for the, for the, for the, for that was, and that was me preparing for the first big opportunity, right? Like the big first celebrity. I right. Worked with. Right. Right. But as an assistant, I had moved to New York, you know, Sally looked me up and down and said, New York's going to hit you in five minutes. And I had no style and it was just, like, it was bad. It was a disaster. And so I get this call, probably working at the salon in New York for maybe weeks, maybe a couple months, somewhere around there. And Mark calls the salon. And so he's supposed to send, I'm, they were supposed to send an assistant. So I show up with nothing but my, you know, lint in my pockets. And he's like, okay, so you can set up over there. And I was like, cool. Like, <laughs> what do you want me to set up? He's like, do you have your kit? And I was like, what's a kit? <laughs> and there was just this immediate, like, I think it says more about him than anything that he was just, like, okay, cool. You're green. <laughs> this is what I have to work with. He didn't, he never wow. made me feel uncomfortable or anything like that. And it says a lot about him. And so I was just extremely embarrassed and I don't have anything. What do I need? And so I just basically looked at his kit, took pictures of his stuff. And I, and I immediately afterward went down to Canal Street where you can buy these, you know, $15 bags. I bought the cheapest suitcase I could. I went to Wigs and Plus on 14th Street again and looked for the cheapest curling irons. I literally had no money at this time uh, and tried to put my kit together and build it over time. And eventually, obviously, you build a kit. But I certainly wasn't getting anything free from brands back then. <laughs> no. So, not. but yeah, it was, it, was, it was a very unprepared moment. But I do think I technically I was prepared 
and and that showed and i was capable but what i think kind of the 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 whole point of why those relationships carried on was that it came down to whether or not i was ready to do that and how much time i had invested previously unknowing of that i would ever work on a set or with celebrities that was not an option for me in my head at the time i was really focused on salon and I just didn't, I didn't even know what that was like or how you get started or whatever, which we'll talk a little bit about today. But I highly encourage people looking to get into or, or looking for change or looking for, to explore new directions, start practicing, start doing it now, start right, trying new right. things. Be prepared there's no, for when no that payoff. comes. There's z- zero payoff on a daily basis for me going home and doing braids every single day or watching hair cutting DVDs or buying my own extensions and wasting them trying to install them on a on a mannequin head you get nothing from that but being prepared does pay off so it's like just be as prepared for your opportunity there's a story it's with Celine Dion and Josh Groban you probably probably know this story it's like such a such a powerful career moment that Josh Groban was like 17 years old he was singing and singing and singing and singing his heart out like really really a hard working individual developing his voice as a teenager and I think he was 17 or 19, somewhere close to that age, right? And he gets a call from the producer who's producing the show and who works with Celine Dion and Andrea Bocelli got sick and he could not make this performance. And so a CD had been sent to this producer a long time before. And so he dug it up, remembered it, and, and he was like, okay, I think this kid's prepared. And so he calls up Josh Groban and he says, can you do this? And he's like, oh my gosh, there's no way. There's, I, there's no way I can sing in that key. Can, you, the, can you fill in for Andrew Can Bocelli? you fill in for Andrea Bocelli? <laughs> yeah. Singing and he's like, with Celine Dion at some event. Yeah. And the nerves, I mean, I mean, imagine he must have been feeling as a young person. And this was, the song is one of the most famous. It's called you know, the, the, the Prayer. Yeah, yeah, The Prayer. There you go. Extremely difficult. Technically, a key that's not easy for a guy to sing in. Singing with Celine Dion in a stage in front of so many people. It was for a major, major event. Might have been the Grammys or might, might have been some... I forget the event. But basically, he says, no, I can't. And this producer said, yes, you can. I know you can. I know you're prepared for this. I know you've been working for this. I've heard your work. I've been watching you. And I think you are. And it, and, and it was because that person knew that he had been preparing, that this person could trust Josh Groban to come in. They did one basically half of a rehearsal. That's all the time they had to do it. He had one rehearsal with her and then the performance. And there is just no and, and way. it was a huge launching point for his career. Huge. That was it. That was the moment of his career. Yeah, that was it. He was a nobody before that. And so there are these inflection points, these moments in which opportunity will come to you, but it must be preceded by preparation and preparedness. So that's luck. Like luck is, Oprah said that. I don't know if she coined that phrase, but. Luck is when opportunity meets the prepared. If you want to dig deeper into improving your relationship with money as a creative professional, go to millionairehairstylistpodcast.com, create a free student account, and you can access over four hours of free financial lessons on topics like calculating exactly what financial freedom would look like for you as a creative professional. Go to millionairehairstylistpodcast.com, create your free account today. I don't think she coined it, but I've heard that. Yeah. Luck has been prepared and it's an opportunity to meet. So I think there's a good starting point there. So, okay. So let's, let's, let's be somewhat procedural about this. It's like, okay, you want to have an opportunity to do something outside of the world that you currently exist in. And you get that first opportunity and you be as prepared as you can for that opportunity. So in, in, in the case of what you were doing, you were practicing your craft to be as proficient as you possibly could. So then my question to you is, you had that first experience as an assistant. How did you start getting more assistant work? What did you do to get that more assistant work? Let's stay in that sort of assistant era for a second. What was that like trying to get more on set work and, and do more of those shoots? I didn't try, actually. I just got fired. And then I... I <laughs> there was fired really... From the salon. Yeah, zero trying. That was an amazing opportunity. I wonder what will ever happen again. I didn't really have the foresight of being, let me start a database and let me start calling people. And let me start networking and I'm going to need to know producers. There's just, no, my gosh, there was zero, zero foresight. And uh, that, that was when I got fired, I went to work for another salon, very promptly got fired. But the owner said to me, I'm not firing you because you're not a good hairdresser or you're not a good worker. You certainly have a good work ethic. I know you can do hair. You just don't belong in a salon. You're not a salon hairdresser. 
you're not going to show up day in and day out and not want something different every single day. You're not going to want you're like you're so here's what I'm going to do. I have a job for she was the ambassador of Clairol at the time. She has a campaign she was shooting for Clairol. She said, you can be the hairdresser. She was a colorist. And I'll introduce you to my agent. So I'll give you your first job, commercial job wow. that pays. And I'll introduce you to my agent at this agency. And so that agent wanted to meet with me and said, do you have a portfolio? And because I had been shooting every weekend with a friend of mine, I had a full portfolio. And so I was able to take that meeting with a portfolio. She was able to look at my work and say, I think you have a future. I think you can do this. And she gave me my first shot. Basically, they didn't take me on their roster right away. But then it was very quickly after I was on set with Mark Townsend. And so he, his, he, he hired you more than once. He brought you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I was, I was an assistant for him for a couple of years. And I remember I was on set with him with two major celebrities. and. We were in their apartment. I was doing one of their hair. He was doing the other. And I told him like, hey, Mark, I got this like crazy offer from my agency today, like right now. They sent me an email and said, hey, we want to represent you like officially. I had done a few jobs for them. They got some good feedback and they said, cool, like we think you're in. He's like, oh no, not them. I'm calling my agent right now. You're going with my agency. And, really? uh, and so, yeah, <laughs> basically he put the two agencies against each other to try and get me on their roster, which was an incredible position to be in. So I emailed back. I was like, oh my gosh, I just got an offer from X agency out in LA. I don't know what I'm going to do. I want to be respectful to Mark and I don't want to, I don't want to be disrespectful to the first opportunity. It's kind of stuck in this conundrum. And ultimately I had to make a choice and picked one agency. And that's when I started actually getting my own jobs, but I would also assist other hairdressers while doing my own job. So the jobs I was working were often free most often free to build up a better commercial book because I had a very strong editorial, not as strong as in quality, <laughs> but strong as in full, full editorial book, but wanted more commercial work with larger names in it. Let's talk about that for a second. So, okay. So what we've, what we've said thus far is you, you, you wait for an opportunity or you seek out an opportunity. You get that first opportunity, you be as prepared as you can. And, and as I said, I think you really have to swing and knock it out of the park as best as you possibly can so that people feel like, I want to give you another opportunity. Because again, people I think who are hardworking and conscientious often don't realize how rare that is. So if you are a hard worker, if you are persistent, you sort of think that's how everyone is and it's just not how everyone is. So if you can come and really deliver and really show up, you become immediately someone that people want more of all the time. So you really have to keep that in mind. But then there's another aspect of this, again, just kind of talking shop here a little bit, but there's another aspect of this. It's very true. And again, I can speak to this as a producer who has hired many hairstylists and many makeup artists and many production designers and cinematographers and every category is it's very difficult once you get into the onset world to get work in categories you have not already done work. So if you are only doing, let's say, editorial, so magazines, so big wigs and interesting looks. That was kind of your niche. And someone's like, I need someone to do a commercial shoot for Ford Motor Company. And they look at your book and you don't have commercial work. There's this weird dynamic where they just, they go, well, I'd rather get someone who has clearly done a lot of other car commercials. A bad example, because it's a car, not a person, but you get my point. You know, I'd rather get someone who has done a lot of this category of work because I'm not sure if that person can do this category. So there's a kind of a category jump challenge for everyone at a certain point in their career. That it is, and it's it's a consistent element. It's nothing against the person in general. It's just always, no one wants to, when they're hiring someone and they're going to spend money on that person, everyone's always trying to hire the right person, someone who they know is going to execute on the job because no one wants to get halfway through the day and go, has this guy never done a commercial before? Why is he bringing a wig to set, right? Like that's a <laughs> yeah. fear that people have that, that, that yes. someone is not going to understand the mission. Yeah. So when you were doing the, you were doing wigs, that was your claim to fame. That was your sort of thing. And you wanted more commercial work. What were you doing to try and show the industry, hey, I can do this other stuff too? Was that something you were doing consciously? Was that something your agent was telling you to do? How were you sort of branching into these other departments to try and build competency and sort of a, a, a reputation in other categories so you could get more work? So I was fortunate to be assisting some pretty like world-class hairdressers. And I just reached out for advice to my mentors, the people I was assisting when I was on set. Hey, I think I, I don't want to start with celebrities. I'd rather start in fashion. And back then... I was told, wow, that's a, that's a really good observation because back then 
it was very difficult. If you had built up a portfolio of celebrities, the whole fashion industry, which is like what paid because celebrities didn't, would look down on you. Basically, it's like, oh yeah, you do cheesy normal hair and you can't actually do a Calvin Right, like, like the campaign. Tonight Show. Let's be clear what we mean. Someone's going to go on the Tonight Show and they need their hair done. That's like a celebrity job versus yeah. someone who's going to walk the runway for Oscar de la Renta and they want someone to do their hair. Those are considered two very different buckets of, of work. Or even like, you know, the runway shows don't pay much either. It's, I would say it's more the difference of you're going to shoot for a Maybelline ad and they're just, okay, they're sure. not going to yeah, hire yeah. that. They, back then, they were not going to hire that little celebrity hairdresser because that was not respected. This <laughs> the was little the time celebrity when, hairdresser. This was the time when models were still on the cover of magazines. You have, remember back, this is a totally different world. And it was just, be, celebrities were just becoming fashion icons at the way that we recognize them today. Now the tables are totally different, right? But back then, you had to have a strategy of, I want to be respected in the fashion world. And then the celebrities will want you. And then you can work with the celebrities. You do the Calvin Klein campaign. You do the Maybelline campaign. You do the Prada campaign, right? Then the celebrities are, I'll pay for him. Now it's, you know, the celebrities will get me that person. They did this other celebrity. So it's a, it's a very different world. And, and it's extremely hard. The fashion is the hardest to break into. And I thought, I'm going to go after the big kahuna. I'm going to be the next Luigi Moreno or Julian Dees, 50 covers of Vogue, you know, and, and now nobody cares about that stuff, right? It's not nobody, but very few people dying to know who did the cover of Vogue, the hair this month. Right. It just doesn't right. matter like it used to. As opposed to who was on Instagram doing someone with 40 million followers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a very... Social credibility is accomplished in very different manners. So that strat... You have to have... You had to have a career strategy. And in order for me to develop that, I just had to look at the paths of the people who went before me and say like, okay, what have you done? What do you suggest? And just asking my mentors. And that's what helped me develop my career strategy for eventually... I did fashion first, just like I wanted to. I did the runway shows and traveled and assisted the major Guido and all these major, major hairdressers in the fashion world, then started doing advertising work, then started doing the fashion work, more like more magazine covers and things like that. And then eventually started working with celebrities toward the end of my career. So I think intentionality is really, really important. It goes back to just kind of setting a clear path for knowing what you want, but it's done very differently these days. It was all about like... Your but, but I think the there. principles... Let's be clear though. The principles are the same. So I want to point something out. And this is exactly what I've seen happen in, in other creative lanes. So, okay. You get your first opportunity. You get your foot in the door. You start doing those kinds of jobs over and over again. You build up a competency. You build up a reputation. Maybe you get a representation. Maybe you build a portfolio. Maybe you have an Instagram feed that starts to really look like you're doing something regularly that people can identify. Then at a certain point, you look at the people ahead of you and the thing, people that have built out careers and you say, okay, who would I really want to be like? What do I want to be doing? I, I want to do more fashion. I want to do big ad campaigns. I want to work with celebrities. I want to go be on films, feature films, right? So you kind of look, you look at who, who's doing what you want to be doing and you ask them, you go talk to them because you're working with the people on set. That's how it's a very networky sort of relationship. You know, you get referred by one person to work with somebody else and now you work with that person and now you're sitting across from them at lunch, right? And Alexei Lubomirsky, the famous photographer who did the royal wedding photos, was talking about this, how you as a young hairstylist would come up to him. He's a photographer, but someone certainly that was successful. And you would ask great, great questions. And I always recommend this to people. It's like, never discount the value. Never discount that almost all successful people, it's rare to meet a successful person that is not willing to share with someone who is coming up the advice on how to do what they've done or how to be successful or or just to share their story. People like to talk about themselves. They like to give advice. Now, there are exceptions. There are mean people. But I would say if if you have an existing rapport with someone, you've been their assistant or you work with them on set and you say, hey, I really love, I, I've seen your work. I love what you're doing. Could I buy you coffee and just ask you about a little more about what you're doing? It's so rare, I think, that people would say no to that, especially if you if you come into it. And Alexi talked about this. You don't come into this with, let me spend the next hour telling you my plan for my career and you nod your head and tell me if I'm correct or not. You don't do that because the conversation is not about you. It's about them. Tell me about how you got where you're getting. What, would, what advice would you give to someone who wants to work more in editorial or wants to work in feature film? What are some mistakes you see people making? What are some mistakes that you know, when you ask people these questions, you interview them, people I find generally want to talk about themselves and want to share their story. And when you do that, Cash, this I think was such a driver for you in your career is you're getting world-class, you're in New York City, this is a major market for this kind of thing. You're getting world-class people to give you insight and advice 
directly from their own experience. That's so invaluable. And then this is the this is the hard one. I know people are gonna have a hard time wrapping their heads around this, so I'm just gonna say it very clearly. Take their advice. <laughs> like do what they're suggesting. Yeah. <laughs> don't do this thing where you go, oh, they don't really know me. If they say, well, you know, you should really go. For instance, if you want to work on that set, you maybe should go be a PA for that person first. Well, I'm not a PA anymore. I'm not a production assistant. I'm a whatever. It's like if they're giving you a way in, if they're giving you a technique or an advice or a thing, go do some free jobs. I don't do free. Whatever advice they're giving you, it's probably worth paying attention to. And if you follow that advice quite often, you can start to build a career in the direction you want to go simply because you're you're getting input from people that have done it before and are giving you wise counsel. There's certainly, there's social boundaries on how to approach these people. And what you said was very poignant. It was, if you have an established rapport, it's very unlikely someone would say no to giving advice. And I think it's really important that it's like cold outreach to get something is very weird. Yeah, I don't no. ever recommend that. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to answer if somebody's just like, respond to me, you know, like, DM me or email me. It's, there's just no way I can dedicate time to that. It's not that I'm cold or I don't want to help. It's just, just no way I can do it and still do what I need to be doing. So I think. Having that established rapport where I was, I'm assisting, I'm, I'm, I'm helping, or I'm the hairdresser on set. So can I borrow you for a minute? Like a normal conversation, you know, it's, there needs to be something there before you intimate 100%. taking. But when I ask questions of mentors, one tact, not, not a tactic, but one thing I like to do is what you said and keep it, keep things them focused instead of asking, like, what do I need to be doing right now as a young hairstylist? What's advice you would give yourself that you wish you knew when you were young? Ask it about them. And all you're doing is rephrasing your questions to just help them be more reflective, more self-reflective and more, I would say, nostalgic. And that conversation will be a lot more pleasant for both of you guys, I, I th at least if, with what I've experienced in what I've asked. And I love those conversations. I still call my mentors all the time. I still love to ask like, well, what did you do? You've, you've been here. Like, just questions about them. Get them to tell stories. And you can extrapolate the, the, the wisdom from those. Don't be like, yeah, tell yeah. me what it, to do. They, like, they're not going to give you the that. step by step. Yeah. But, but I will give you some examples. I mean, I, I, there was times in my career where I would have a mentor who I would say, hey, I'm really trying to learn this specific skill. Can you help me with this skill? And they'd say, okay, well, here's a script do you want to go try out building a budget for this script? And then I'll look at the budget and tell you what I think, because I'm a producer. So my job is to determine how much things cost. And I would spend, you know, dozens of hours on an exercise just to, just to complete the assignment so that I could get their feedback on the work that I was doing. Because it was like, yeah, I wasn't getting paid for it. It was a phantom exercise, but this person was willing to let me try something out and then they would give me their X. I mean, this is a guy who had worked with, you know, Tom Cruise and Alexander Payne and like huge, huge, huge people in the film world. And he's like, yeah, if you take this script and you would make a budget for it, I'll look at it. Well, I did because it was like, absolutely, I'll take. And then when you do that, those people, that particular person is the reason that I ended up becoming a producer on an HBO series because his wife was the producer and said, Hey, I'm looking for someone and who did he suggest? You know what I mean? So when someone gives you advice or when someone says that they'll look at something or when someone gives you that sort of olive branch, take it, show that show that work and that, that follow through. They say, you've said this before, Cash. If they say, I think in our course, you say this, if a mentor tells you to read a book, read the damn book. Yeah. Don't say like to them, oh yeah, I never really got around to it. Yeah. Read the book. Because it's like, what's this game that you're going to play where you're going to ask them for things, but then you're not going to take action on the things you're going to ask them. And then they're going to want to give you more input. Like no one wants to just throw, no one, no one, I, I genuinely believe people want to help others. People who are successful want to help those who've come up or coming up. No one wants to waste their time. No one wants to talk to someone that's going to just argue. I've had conversations. Sometimes I'll have a conversation with somebody who's coming up and it's a great conversation. I've had other conversations where they'll say a bunch of things to me and I'll say like, I don't think your perspective is correct on those things. And then they'll just argue with me for the rest of the conversation. It's like, well, dude, like I only have so much time to have an argument. I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for a conversation where I can tell you what I think. And if you're interested in that, that's great. You know, so, so how you approach. Okay. So let's, let's, let's re review. So you get your first opportunity, you prepare for that opportunity. Then you set the direction you want to go by paying attention to the people that are in front of you. You ask them for their input. If you've built rapport with someone where you can really sit them down, you can get world-class advice. You don't have to read 
articles on the internet to figure out how to steer your career. You can get people who are literally successful doing the thing you want to do to sit down with you for 35 minutes over a cup of coffee or a phone conversation or a Zoom or on set during lunch, and they will give you that advice if you are the kind of person that is clearly worth investing in. So then, Cash, I would That's say the from key you there- just said. You want the secret to getting the best mentors in the world? Become a person worth knowing. That's the secret. No. Oh, become a person worth, is it, become, what do we say in the course? Become a person worth meeting and knowing. Like, yes, yes. Become, become more valuable. If people don't want to give you the time of day, there's a reason. Do everything you possibly can to be a person worth knowing. And when you become a person worth knowing, you can have a very, very powerful imp impact on the planet and every relationship you have and opportunities come to you so much easier. Like things, things, magic happens. It's crazy when you focus on personal development and becoming a person worth knowing. And that can just mean you're a person of very good character, of very good values. Right. This is not about status. This no, is not it's, about yes. wealth. This is not about aesthetic. This is not about having the right. And I wanted to bag. clarify this is literally that. Literally yeah. about, yeah. Are you somebody who is, who is showing good faith effort towards the things you say you want and a willingness to support and engage with others and be reciprocal and help and, you know, another example, by the way, would be someone saying to you, I mean, this is a, this has absolutely happened to me and I know it's happened to you is, well, look, I don't want to hire you for X thing, but there's someone who needs that thing for free this weekend. Say yes. <laughs> like, no, you're not going to work for free for the rest of your life. But if you get that opportunity, even if it doesn't pay, if it seems like an opportunity that's going to move you forward, take that opportunity. That's assuming, that's assuming you have more time than opportunities, that, that there's a season for saying yes to free stuff. And so it's always it's always good to be be clear on when that season comes to an end and of when course. it doesn't. But of course, uh, yeah. in the beginning, it was like I said yes to everything in the beginning because there's a season for yes and there's a season for no. You need to determine when those seasons are in your life. And I made the mistake of thinking I was in a no season too early in my career. I just got I got too too big headed, too. Um, and you know, honestly, at the time, I got so big headed. I was just like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. My, I, my agent literally, despite me, just stopped sending me jobs for four months. And I had another hairstylist say that they got drunk at a restaurant. And he told me, he's like, dude, we, we went out and this is what she said. And this is what she's doing. Like, and I was like, oh my gosh, you basically like saved me. I had no idea what was going on. Wasn't working. And, and it, because you were turning down jobs, you didn't think paid enough. What were yeah, you she was trying to? to? She was trying to get work, you know, it was, yeah, it was unpaid jobs that were like, I thought I was too good for at the time. And I was not, it's absolutely not looking back. It was like, I've shot Vogue covers and I've done this. And, and that wasn't like my, how I was talking, but it just in my head, I was like, no, I think I'm going to say no to that. I just think I'm sort of like, I'm not positioned to do that stuff. I don't want to walk on set and be like at that level again, you know? And it's like, oh my gosh, please dude, I want to look back and like, if I could just meet that person, I'd smack them in the face. <laughs> I would. It was. I'd like to know, like, by the way, that it's not all like I climbed the Empire State Building one floor at a time. I like to know that maybe you got out on a few floors and kind of wait, you know, <laughs> it wasn't all just con oh, continual, <laughs> continual success. I mean, you kept my hair for so long, you definitely made some mistakes. Um, let me ask you this, Cash, though, because I know that if we don't, if I don't ask you this question, this audience is going to be very mad at me. And the question is this. So, how did you start working with AAA celebrities? And I don't just mean the one-offs. I mean, and you can say as much as you want about who we're talking about here, but I mean the people that were literally saying, I like you, come with me for the next year and be my person. How did you get to that level? I think at that point, you build over a decade of doing it, you build a reputation in the industry among other professionals. And those other professionals obviously want to keep clients pretty tight knit. And so they'll make referrals when they're sick or when they can't make it. And so these are like once in a very blue moon opportunities that you like get through these doors. And uh, those were obvious yeses, right? It's like I was, I was put on, it was like, I remember one opportunity for Kim Kardashian. It was like, uh, I don't know, must've been 11 o'clock at night. I had no way of getting a kit. I had, I had flown to Los Angeles uh, for the opportunity, bag got lost, no kit. I called this hairstylist that I used to assist. He was a dream. He woke up and literally put his kit out on his front door in in Washington Heights, I believe. No, not Washington Heights. Where Silver Silver Lake. Dro like rented a car, drove to Silver Lake. This is like all night. I'm trying to hunt down a kit so that I can do Kim Kardashian's hair. 
Uh, and then I, I've done all this work and then it cancels on me like an hour before I'm supposed to arrive. <laughs> oh no. And, it, and it's like, no. there are going to be moments where you're like, everything's a disaster and I'm putting everything in. I have to make this good and I need hair and I have to go. And I literally went and bought, I had to go because my hair kit was gone. I had to go in the morning buy That's not all cheap. this stuff. No. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so you're, you're going to hit road bumps. Uh, that happened those, more than once to you, brother. I remember you calling me from like the lobbies of hotels and it would be this AAA person is going needs me to do their hair, but it there's a chance that they won't arrive in time and the job will get canceled. But I need to wait here just in case. Like yes, those there kinds are those, of moments, yeah. very high stakes. You know, you have to just be there, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You know that those those moments happen for sure. They do. Lots of them happened. <laughs> Lots of those. Okay, but when it worked, like, when it worked well, why? What, what was it, that? What was that? That that road that got you towards those really major clients. I think it was relationships. That industry is 100% relationships. If you want to start working with celebrities, you got to know people. And in order to know people, you got to know people. And in order to know those people, you got to know the people below them. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a long ramp up of building relationships that accumulate to opportunities of that size. And I, I can't repeat this enough. Opportunity will always come from a person. Money will always come from a person. You just have to be that person that's like, who has my opportunity? Who do I need to meet? Who do I need to serve? Who do I need to connect with? Who do I need to know? Where do I need to go to meet those types of people? It's just asking those questions all the time. And then when you go to set, if you have that mindset, instead of being like sitting on your chair on your phone, go meet the makeup assistant. You don't know what job she's going to get called in for tomorrow and be the biggest thing. That happened so many times where that makeup assistant that was assisting or, the, or even like my assistants went on to be like great celebrity hairdressers. And, and these people are like nobodies on Instagram and now they have like millions of followers, right? There's just go and meet everybody. If this is something you're if like, if you want opportunity in life, this is not just for celebrities. This is like a universal principle. Go be known and know people. Go be known. Okay, but Go I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna add some color to this because again, I have a unique position, which is not only have I been your friend for wow, more than 10 years. When I first met you, I was not working in, in any production capacity. And for a long time I was you were just a friend. And then you started cutting my hair because we had a mutual friend whose hair you were cutting and we lived together. And so it was just easy to say, like, hey, can you do Jordan's hair as well? And then at a certain point, I said, I want to come work in film. And you got me my first job ever as a production assistant on that product commercial. And that was seven years ago. And, and the rest is, is history. But I have spent many hours with you. Well, and I was the production assistant or the AD or whatever, as I climbed the ladder, uh, when you were the hairstylist. And so I have seen how you interact with people on set. And you are a colossal asshole. No, I'm kidding. You are... <laughs> No, but I mean this very, I, I'm going to say this and I, I, I am genuinely not making this up for the sake of a great podcast and or to blow smoke. You were the kind of person on set that when you moved to Texas and I would be talking to people who I knew had spent time with you on set and I would mention your name, everybody universally would say, oh, I love cash. Cash is the best. And there's a reason that they would say that. Not only were you talented, uh, but you were just very kind to everyone. And you were very present and you were never flustered and you were very energetic and upbeat and encouraging and you always had a laugh and you had a great way of talking to the people in your chair and getting to know them and making them feel like the center of the world. We've told this story. I don't think we ever said this publicly, but you, you and I've talked about this many times. You know, if someone needed something done in 10 minutes, you'd say, okay, I can do, here's what I can do in 10 minutes. If someone said, I need this done in an hour, you'd say, okay, here's what I can do in an hour. You were never the person that freaked. You know, because there are people that will, that will say, oh my gosh, I don't have enough time to do blah, blah, blah. And they just, it's suddenly, it's like, they're the center of a problem. You are never a problem. You are always a, a solutions person. You always figured it out. You have 10 minutes, I'll do it in 10. You have an hour, I'll do it in an hour. And that is why to this day, if I ever run into someone who worked with you, they all say universally, oh my God, I love cash laws. Cash laws is the best. Oh, ca you know, cash, what's cash doing now? I haven't seen cash in forever. He's buying real estate in Texas. Of course he is, which is usually yeah. what they say. But because everyone always knew you were you were off the different things. But so I think, you know, again, we've said you get your first opportunity, prepare for that opportunity, kick ass in that opportunity. Talk to the people that you meet and start to build a plan for how you want to get where you want to go. Listen to the mentors that you are working with. Understand that if you're going to get to crazy difficult opportunities like 
being the head hairstylist in a major feature film or working with a major celebrity or going on tour with a singer or whatever you're doing, it's going to be a people based business. You have to build relationships with people. And then I would say as the final point on that is be kind to people. Be kind to people. Be kind to the people that you work with. Show them respect, every single one of them on set. Because exactly like you said, you don't know if that assistant is going to blow up on Instagram tomorrow. You just don't know. And it's not that you should be kind to people because they might blow up. It's because it's just the best way to build this people game, this people world that our, a friend of mine said one time, he said, the film industry is an inherently social business. Now he's talking about specifically film, but I think a lot of production is like this. It's a social industry. So if you, if you can't be excellent and kind, you're, you're going to have a much harder time. And that was obviously, it was self-evidently something that propelled you in your career. Yeah. Uh, hey, this is the benefit of hindsight, right? I didn't know that I was like being nice to assistants or, you know, anything like that. Really, I was just kind of copying Alexi. And I was like, you know, it's like Alexi's great on set. I just, I, I think that's kind of how I want to be on set when I'm a professional. And so when I went out on my own, I just kind of em embraced his energy and and that's the presence I wanted to have. And I want, I genuinely wanted to know people and, and have a good time on set. I didn't want to like, you know, I don't want to be miserable. Yeah. yeah it has so to I be think, fun. It's, yeah, it's 12 hours. Yeah. It's 14 hours. It's 15 oh, hours. It's yeah. 16 hours. If you can't have fun with it, then it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think the result was that I built a network, a really powerful network of relationships. But that, but at the beginning, that's not like I was like, I'm going to be a networker. I, I it was not even, that was not even crossing my mind. I think in hindsight, I think it's an important thing to do. Just, you know, be good to people on set, have a good time and be that, be the presence that everyone wants to have, you know, around. And yeah, stuff just goes better. If you're that person that always brings levity and lightness to any situation, I think it's, yeah, it's a good way to be. If you, if you liked this conversation, please do us a favor. Let us know um, in Instagram or let us know through a DM or give us a review in the platform of your choice. And I would also encourage if this is a topic that's interesting to you and you want to hear from the master of this, the person who has done this to easily seven figure success while maintaining an onset career, go listen to our conversation with Alexi Lubomirsky. I think people slept on that episode to a certain extent because hairstylists and other creatives tend to only want to listen to people that are sort of what they do. He's a photographer listen to that episode because he really talks about where all this came from for him. And he has been such a North star for you, Cash. And then as a, sub, as a, as a, as a fall off for me as well of just exactly what we're talking about, because I mean, you want to talk about growing from an assistant to the top. You, this is a guy who did Harry and Megan's wedding. There's just no more. There's find me a better top. And, and yeah. I dare you. <laughs> So when you want to hear from someone and have that opportunity to have that conversation, go listen to that episode because I think you'll find that to be inspiring and really insightful and something that will really propel everything that we've discussed in, in this conversation. If you're a hairstylist, if you're a creative professional and you are interested in your financial well-being, remember to like and subscribe so that more episodes just like this one show up in your YouTube feed. Okay.